welcome to the video. This one is another one about five of the unknown, forgotten, forget them rock bands of the pub rock era who were fantastic and who deserve to be remembered. The first one is actually a very short-lived band, but they are remembered because they are one of the most successful bands of the pub rock era, and that is The Motors. You're fixing the mind of the road ahead. At last you're gonna be free. Now, it's a bit of a long, convoluted story for the Motors because they were formed by Nick Garvey when he left Ducks Deluxe. He had another band in the meantime, but let's not go into that. The first gig was in March 1977. I wasn't really a huge fan because I, their set was a series of really good songs, but punctuated with all these deliberate hits like Airport and stuff like that. So I wasn't a huge fan, but they did very well. I think they had number four with, with Airport. And then they lasted about a year and a bit and they played the Reading Festival in 1978 and they broke up. So that's the motors. Very good. When you hear airport on the radio, you think, oh, that's a nice song. But largely forgotten. And that takes us on to another of the heroes. Before we get there, can I just say, if you like this, please like, comment, let me know what you think that's important to me. And um, don't forget to subscribe if you're not already subscribed. The second person I want to talk about is John B. Spencer, who is very hard to talk about because he was a friend of mine, apart from being, I don't know, a bit of an artistic genius because he started off, he was an artist, he ran an agency for artists, which is very successful, which he sold for loads of money, wrote novels. I published a few in the later days just before he died. He's with my Do Not Press. They were like science fiction-y detective stories. And then he wrote more gritty, Elmore, Leonard-style books set in West London and very well written and he was well what we're talking about here he was a musician I first came across him probably when I was doing the John Bull Chiswick because everybody in those days there were two names in West South West London that everybody talked about and that was Johnny G Spencer. The B came slightly later. It's to do with a cacao. I'm exactly what it was. It's to do with oh, that, was it a John Spencer blues explosion? It was something to do with something like that because there was another John Spencer or something. So to differentiate, because in those days it was just John Spencer's louts was the band that used to pack out the John Bull, the Half Moon Putney, the White Lion, the Stan Garter in at Putney, the King's Head Fulham. All the venues over there were packed. Now John had a very distinctive style. He was a fantastic songwriter. He had a Hit in Scandinavia, of all places, quite early on with Cruising on a Saturday Night, which is one of the great anthems of the time. It, I must admit, it's just sound a bit they're dated now. That may be because I've heard it so many times. I've played all his albums. I've seen him live a lot of times and um, basically I think he was a total genius and he had lots of chances like he was taken on by Rod Stewart's manager at one stage Billy Gaff and John's biggest problem was I thought was he was quite uncompromising if he thought something was right he was going to go ahead I mean one word is stubborn but you couldn't sway him he used to insist on doing things his way he had this gravelly he called it a soulful voice and it certainly was and it was great a few people were irritated by it and i think that must have held him back unfortunately he died of a stroke and went in hospital in the meantime he'd signed to an irish record label and they put out his back catalog and i think he if he did carried on, I think he could have been quite big. His biggest hit, where he was known most, was as a duo album with Johnny G, the guy who he was a rival with, and it was called Out With A Bang, and here's something from that. Out with a bang, gone in a flash. Right, Rugulator, this is really the story of the main man behind Rugulator, who's called Danny Antler. was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. And as a young man, he played with some of the greats of the American blues world, especially locally. He played with Slim Harpo 
and Bootsy Collins and H Bomb Ferguson and people like that. And then he went to San Francisco and played with even more amazing people, such as John Lee Hooker, Solomon Burke, people of that ilk. And he formed a band called Elephant's Memory, which was quite instrumental. It was like an experimental band. And then he moved to London and he formed Rugulator, which was the first signings to Stiff Records. Now, they weren't your straightforward British pub rock band, that's the thing. I went to see him quite a few times and um, I mm, enjoyed it. I could see it was really good, but chassis stuff, to be honest, has never really been my forte. Parts of it were really good. I mean, when he got into to the bluesy, rocking stuff, it was fantastic. And Rue Later lasted, I think, for three years. They played at the Front Row Festival at the Hope and Anchor, which I keep mentioning, because a lot of these bands played that. After Rue Later, he formed a band I preferred, which was the Deluxe Blues Band, who was with a lot of the stalwarts of the British blues and rock industries, such as Mickey Waller, Bob Brunning, Dick Hexel Smith, saxophone player that is, and people like that. And um, they were very liked by the Rolling Stones and they did a few parties for the Stones and I think they did support, and Rue did it too, supporting the Rocket 88 band, which is like the side band of the Rolling Stones pianist Ian Stewart and Charlie Watts was in it and Jack Bruce from time to time. Danny Adler, when he went back to the States, almost managed to fool everybody because he found a long lost album by an old blues man called Otis Elevator Gilmore. And he found these tapes and he gave them to a record label and they put out this album. turned out to be Danny Adler had made those tapes and it was withdrawn and he was in disgrace and that's really the last time I heard of him. Rude Later, one of the top bands on the circuit and very influential. When we went to their gigs you'd see people like Jack Bruce and Charlie Watts in the audience so you, you know, that says quite a lot and it says how much I know that they thought it was great and I thought, mm, yeah, meh. There's a connection to John B. Spencer that I never thought about. When John's sons got together and played his songs in a band they'd formed, one of them, Tom, is a professional musician playing with the men they couldn't hang out, and professionals, and William and Sid are also quite musical. They got together and formed a band to play John's songs so his memory and his songs wouldn't be forgotten, and that band was called Fast Lane Rugulator. Mmm. The next one is The Motors. No, I've done The Motors, haven't I? The next one is Lou Lewis Reformer. Why you buy? Right, Lou Lewis was actually born in West London, I think Hammersmith, and he moved to Canvey Island when he was 13. And he became friends with a young Lee Brillo, who would of course be the lead singer in Dr. Philgood. And Lee taught Lou how to play the harmonica. And then he was part of all that thing when they were playing in those bands in the early days with Lee and Sparko and with Chris. The, the future manager of the Feel Goods called the Southside Jug Band. And Dave Higgs joined and they changed their name. Then Dave Higgs went off and he formed the Eddie and the Hot Rods and they asked Lou Lewis to join them. Now, not a lot of people know this, that he was actually playing on the first two records recorded by Eddie and the Hot Rods. He like, had problems with drugs all his life, to be honest with you. Bit of a wild man. And he went off and he did, did shows and, he, and his most famous song was Lucky Seven. That got him on top of the pops. <laughs> Lou Lewis reformer started playing in the pubs of London and in South End, of course, and Canvey Island about 1978. Every time I saw them after I had to go and, and see them if I wasn't working myself. Because don't forget this time, I was doing my own gigs most of the 70s and 80s. Lou was in a band with Wilco Johnson for a little while, but they fell out after a very short time. Lou had problems with various things, drink and drugs. I can remember with Wilco Johnson, when I was working with him, we were going to do an Irish tour and he came over he was like white face because Lou had been he rested because he'd apparently been skint and he needed money to feed pig because he had his son with him at the time as well. So this is another thing. Not only did, did, did he have a drug problem, he also had, looking after his um, son who was quite young. I think 
He was about 13. Apparently, he robbed a post office with, with a fake gun. Unfortunately, it was the post office where he'd cashed his gyro, and they instantly recognised him. And he got seven years for that. And when he came out, he was never really the same. He appeared at the Cricketers a couple of times, mostly with Eddie and the Hot Rods, who were not the same version as had the hits, because by this time, it's really com You don't even know this, do you? Eddie and the Hot Rods had been reformed with Barry Masters as the frontman, and with people who hadn't been in the original band backing him. And Lou occasionally did a few lots. He also did a few gigs backed by that band as Lou Lewis reformer. And they were great, even though they obviously hadn't really spent a lot of time rehearsing. And sadly, Lou died like two years ago, was it? And um, he'll be missed. So there you go. I think he died just before Wilco did. Because Wilco and he were very, very close, even though Wilco was like, I know that they had, um, it was like a love-hate thing, although it's ma mainly love, to be honest with you. So that's Lou Lewis. Rest in peace, Lou. put the prisoners on quite a lot at the cricketers when I was there between about 83, 84 and 1990. They were from Medway. They're supposed to be a mod band, but I don't think they think so, and I didn't think so, so the, who knows. And um, they always pulled a big crowd, because which is strange, because they pulled a better crowd at the cricketers than they did in North London. And we think it's because a lot of their crowd live between Medway Chatham, I think that I think Rochester, Rochester, I think they're from, and Kennington, which is just south of the River Thames. And they'll go to the cricketers, but they wouldn't go maybe cross the River Thames. Because that's a strange thing about London. If you don't know London, crossing the River Thames can be a big thing. So anyway, the prisoners were, I don't know, a garage band, I would have said, and um, that's what a lot of people call them. And they were fantastic. This is what they sounded like. <laughs> There were a lot of bands from that sort of um, Medway town area. There was Billy Childish's bands, which included the Mighty Caesars and other things. The Prisoners included um, James Taylor, who went off to form, not that James Taylor, the one from Medway, who played uh, a Hammond organ, who went off to form the James Taylor Quartet with Alan and Crockford, who was another one of the Prisoners. There was Graham Day. Uh, as you heard, they had a very raw sound. They were very energetic, they were very, in your face and they were great i really enjoyed them and thing is though they had a bit of success here a lot of people you mentioned about the prisoners don't know anything about it and if you're asking about how the name came about it is not apparently to do with the tv show starring patrick mcguan i am reliably informed it's to do with a song and this is the song well, that's all we got time for. Thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, etc. Comment, let me know what you think. Please, please. See you next time, I hope. Goodbye. And thank you for your support, by the way.